Hi, everyone. I think we have 22 folks and vote here, but essentially we're holding the CDR policy panel here. We have a number of different people actively involved in this space in the US as well as in Europe. And really, as you know, CDR starts to pick up steam, um, you know, quite a bit of that is being driven by policy. And so we want to have some of the folks here today who are actively working and leading in those efforts um, to speak a little bit more on it. And so as part of this panel, um, we will have Eli moderating it for us. Uh, Eli is a researcher at Oxford University uh, and actively involved in a multi-stakeholder philanthropically funded effort to launch a new and independent collaborative CDR advocate for Europe in the spirit of inspired by Carbon 180. And you can learn more about this at cdradvocacy.org. Um, so we look forward to an exciting panel. Uh, with that in mind, Eli I'll, turn, Eli, I'll turn over you to kick off here. Thank you, Kent, and welcome everybody. It's great to have you all with us. Um, yeah, we have a tall order in front of us, which is a whirlwind pour, uh, tour of CDR policy over the next hour. And I think it's a really, it's a really interesting topic because unlike other climate solutions, typically we might think of solar or wind, which have a sort of light at the end of the tunnel, they can become profitable in their own right. Carbon removal is one of those unique interventions that always needs somebody to pay for it. And that's why government and, and policy plays a massive role in setting up an enduring state someday, we hope, where carbon removal is essentially the law of the land. And if you emit, you must remove. So we have a fantastic panel um, here today, a few sort of housekeeping or introductory pieces. First of all, there's a poll that Jason has launched on the right-hand side, just so we use all of the bells and whistles of Hopin, where we're asking everybody to just uh, give an indication of your experience level with CDR policy specifically. I know that a lot of the members of the air miners community, there's a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of folks that might not uh, be as directly engaged with policy uh, as, as others. So it'll be great to just get a sense of people's involvement. The other piece is that um, I think similar to other sessions you might have attended earlier in the day, after the first 30 minutes, after we hear from Patricia, Aaron, Chris, we're going to transition over to a much more interactive session where if you click uh, join or, or ask to, to speak, I can actually admit you and you can ask your question live as if we were in a room together. So please start thinking as you're listening to the panelists in the beginning about what questions you want to ask and how we can make this a, a bilateral conversation, multilateral conversation. Um, I, I'm going to ask um, all the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, maybe we can just do uh, Aaron, Patricia, and Chris, and then uh, I'll, I'll come back to me and I'll, I'll sort of uh, kick off the question, the questions and the, the framing for the session. Can we turn it over to you, Aaron, just for a brief intro? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks so much. Excited to talk policy. Um, so I'm Aaron Burns. I'm the executive director of Carbon 180. We're a climate NGO focused entirely on carbon removal and started back in 2015. I know we got a shout out from Kent in the beginning. I'm really excited to work with Eli and others to expand the success that we've had. But we're really focused on U.S. federal policy these days, um, but really see ourselves at the intersection of science, industry, and policy. Um, we've seen a huge amount of success and activity in U.S. federal policy over the past few years. So really excited to talk about both what we've seen happen here in the U.S. and sort of what we can see or how we can see that being exported to Europe. Patricia. Hello, everyone, and also great to be here with this uh, amazing group of panelists. Uh, I am the co-founder and non-executive director of the Carbon Wall Center, a nonprofit uh, based in, in the UK that's focused in uh, creating an ecosystem assemblage approach to greenhouse gas removals. So we work in collaboration with industry, policymakers, uh, and also the, the public to realize that uh, to realize and scale the, the carbon removal uh, technologies. Thanks. And Chris? Great. Yeah, my name is uh, Chris Nidal. I'm one of the co-founders of Open Air, which is a distributed all-volunteer collective that's focused on advancing carbon dioxide removal um, through both policy and through open R&D projects. So we focus a lot on our advocacy side. Um, all of this takes place on a Discord server, which I can pop in the link at some point. Um, but our focus is really, uh, really more on sort of state and municipal level advocacy and policy development uh, that's favorable to CDR. Well, it's fantastic to have all three of you. This is a, a really, really excellent panel. I also love that I think we're in four different countries, Portugal, Costa Rica, US and UK, if I'm correct. So I'll let the audience guess who's where. Um, 
I think just to kick off with a, a framing for how to talk about CDR policy, I thought I would just kind of share the three uh, things that I think we have to talk about when we talk about CDR policy. And the first is, is really, what do we have? You know, let's be grateful for, for the accomplishments and the policies that have come into play, thanks in large part to the three panelists here and others. So you know, what's already in place and what really went into scoring those wins? And then I think second, we need to say, what do we need? And really acknowledge the fact that the policies we have to support CDR are woefully insufficient to get uh, to, to get to the kind of scale that we're looking for. So what do we need? What kinds of policy support specifically? And that we can get into, you know, at the federal or I should say national government level versus at other levels, different forms of policy can take. And then third and finally, and probably most uh, importantly is what will it take to get there? So what are the barriers to getting these more ambitious policies that can support CDR over the line? What needs to happen to really overcome those barriers? So that's kind of the framing that I'd love to, to take for the conversation. And uh, I'd love to actually kick it off with you, Aaron, and, and really just get a bit of a state of play in the US, which I think you know, North America has become, to some degree, the epicenter of, of CDR policy. There's a lot of really exciting stuff happening. So if you could just walk us through kind of what the state of play is, what we can look forward to, and then we can also get into what did it take to get there? And, and uh, how did C-180 over a period of time actually advance the, that agenda? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to talk. It's my favorite topic. Um, so Perfect. we work primarily on U.S. federal policy, as I mentioned. We do some state level work, so happy to touch a little bit on that. But that's something that Chris does a lot of work on. Um, at the federal level, when I think about carbon removal policy, there are sort of two big things that I think of. One is the 45Q tax credit. This is a tax credit that's been around for several years, but in 2018, it was updated to include direct air capture for the first time ever. Um, the, uh, there were several updates. Uh, carbon tech was included for the first time. There were changes to thresholds, things like that. There was an increase in the value, but direct air capture being included for the first time was a big deal. And I will say, I give a huge amount of credit to Noah and Gianna, who are the co-founders of Carbon 180. Um, I actually met Noah in 2015 when he I worked in Senator Manchin's office and he would come up to lobby uh, and advocate for the inclusion of direct air capture in 45Q, for the inclusion of direct air capture in some of the R&D work that was happening at the on the Energy Committee at the time. And at the time, it was really sort of you have to explain what carbon removal is, and they spend a lot of time also correcting people that it's carbon removal and not like carbon removal. Um, and so a lot of the, the education work that they did in those early years has really laid the groundwork for a lot of those, those, those bigger successes. So inclusion of 45Q um, and the 45Q tax incentive, tax incentive have been hugely impactful already for carbon removal. Um, this is a tax incentive. We have more information on our website about it, but basically it provides $50 to $35 per ton, depending on end use for captured carbon dioxide. The other big bucket I think of when I think of policy support in the US for carbon removal is on the R&D and innovation side. So um, I mentioned the updates of 45Q passed in the beginning of 2018. At the end of 2018, we had the National Academies come out with their roadmap for negative emissions technologies. And this really hit at the same time that you saw the 1.5 degree special report that really emphasized the need for carbon removal. And I think that helped catalyze a lot of action um, in the US. So you really were told this is a, you know, this is something you need for climate. And from the NES, here's what you can do right now. And so a big focus of our work in the first couple of years of our DC policy shop was around funding for carbon removal. And so what we've seen come out of that is direct air capture, for example, has gone from basically no federal support, no federal funding, um, and uh, to tens of millions of dollars per year um, in the past couple of years. And at the end of last year, we saw the first ever dedicated carbon removal R&D program established at the Department of Energy. It's a carbon removal program that is very intentionally not just direct air capture, but calls out agricultural pathways, calls out forestry pathways. Um, and so those pieces are getting more and more support. And we've seen from this administration um, and some of the early, you know, the American Jobs Plan, their skinny budget, um, that really important to them too. So I think you're going to continue to see that R&D support grow at the federal level. Thanks. And I think I'd love to dig into a, a bit more of kind of what enabling environment allowed you to successfully or Carbon 180 and others to get those policies over the line. But before we get there, it might be worth uh, just to go back to that framing of sort of state of play. What do we have? Maybe we can turn it over to Patricia 
and Chris, and Chris, and actually just uh, do a quick survey of you know what 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 supportive policies do we have for CDR outside of the U.S., whether that's in Europe uh, or beyond. Kick it over to you guys. Patricia, you want or Chris? Yeah, you want to jump in first? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I'd let Patricia give a sort of perspective on what's happening in 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 Europe and other places. But I think in addition to the the federal level, we we do really have to sort of focus on what has to happen and could potentially happen on the subnational level, um, certainly on the state level, but e even on the municipal level. Um, you know, I think if you look at my sort of native industry that I spent 15 years before getting into CDR was solar and um, you know, if you look at places where solar really took off, it tended to be sort of a layer cake of national policies and then state policies. So it wasn't a coincidence that California, New York, New York, New Jersey, and a few other places really led the way. It was because they all had that investment tax credit, which is kind of like a 45Q, you could insert in there, 30% tax credit. But then there would be state tax credits, or there'd be property tax abatements, there'd be favorable interconnection rules. So all of these things that ultimately happen on the incentive side of the local level are really, really important in terms of where, where it moves first. I would also say um, with that, there's in those states, a lot of them have already and cities existing climate legislation that they're obligated to get certain reductions by 2050. So when they're looking at what they have to do, they're already in the mode of how do they squeeze carbon out of every sector of their state or city economy. And many of them as they're formulating that, there are gaps in certain sectors. So what you see at that level is real potential plays for CDR to fill those gaps in a really, really tangible way. So it's a different types of conversation when you already have, you know, that kind of thing in place. And um, I also think the states, there's, as Aaron um, and I have, you know, we've worked together, particularly on concrete decarbonization, we've seen that the relationship between policies at the state level can spread horizontally. There's conversations between different states that kind of the, the laboratory of democracy sort of idea. But then that also informs uh, the federal government, you know, and so you can get a lot of stuff happening at the state and local level that gives us an idea of what model policy might look like that can then evolve into federal programs. So for for all these reasons, it's also it's a lot easier to get into. Uh, there's a lot more targets when you're talking about state and local legislation, you know, so there's a lot more potential moments for innovation and there's a lot more access. You know, I think Aaron's experience um, in dealing on the Hill, you know, the federal government, they're designed to sort of deflect direct engagement with constituents. That's part of what they're able to, they take it in, but they're good at managing that. A lot of times at the state level, it's a storefront that you walk into in a neighborhood. That's the district office. So the conversations can start to happen a lot quicker than they can at the federal level. So they just can be a lot quicker. So anyway, those are a few points of why we're, we're focused on it. That's helpful. And you've had an interesting point, which is that, you know, CDR policy doesn't have to be, doesn't have to say that on the tin doesn't have to be you know, a policy to advance CDR. It can, it, it can be infused in all kinds of pieces, whether it's bills that support agriculture, forestry, et cetera. So we have to maybe think creatively and uh, about, about uh, utilizing that. Patricia, do you wanna kind of cover um, what's happening outside of the US? We've been very North American centric, I think for good reason, but there's so much else happening outside that it would be good to cover too. Just give us a sure. plan. Let's say I'm not gonna cover the whole world, but I can cover more the European geography. Uh, and also counting with the UK, and I think there's a, a big separation between uh, the European Union nation countries as well as uh, separate from the UK. So, uh, in general, around Europe, there is a big, uh, the, there's a growing momentum for carbon removal. Uh, very recently, the European climate law uh, was passed, so they're going to be. Um, there's going to be focused on emissions reductions, a, a big part, junk uh, of the the net zero targets for the European Union for 20, 2050 are focused on that. But the exciting part of it is that there are also separate targets for carbon dioxide removal. So they're accounting for between two and 5% uh, um, of the, those emissions reductions, um, which is separate, uh, to come from that by 2030. So that's exciting, uh, as well as that, as well as well, first having targets and, and then separate targets from emissions reductions. And I think that's very important as a big step uh, in Europe um, in terms of, well, realizing uh, the potential, the need for carbon removal. That's like the first step in terms of, if you're putting targets, it means that uh, you already understand the in scientific consensus and really uh, understand that you need to focus on it now in order to get um, solutions to scale in, in some years time. So. 
so that's huge, uh, as well as something else. I think the, the p political side of things here matter a lot, as you see with the US, like the political swings can really um, change the momentum or change the, 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 the speed of growth uh, in this area. So uh, Europe is very focused on climate, so that's great. And they also just launched, are gonna launch an independent advisory uh, scientific body for uh, for climates, so kind of like following the steps also from uh, the UK and France who also have uh, have that already. So that will be um, able to 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 let uh, politicians um, decide on their own carbon uh, targets as well, uh, independently of any polit uh, any swing uh, in terms of pol politics. Hopefully. Um, there is also one thing that's interesting that was launched last year from the EU, the recovery package for industrial decarbonization, and part of it focuses on climate-related research and innovation activities. So hopefully uh, some part of carbon removal will come from there as well, or research and innovation that, on that side of things. Um, and then independent, uh, like, uh, yeah, focus on, on specific nations, uh, because you have the, the general target of European Union, uh, but that's a general target. There is no independent targets uh, yet. So that not all the nations have to reach these uh, emissions reductions and carbon removal specifically. It's just a global, global no, but uh, European region level targets. Uh, but there's uh, movement uh, in independent uh, nations, such as, uh, well, the, the, the Swedes uh, have a, a clear climate policy uh, already in place. They're clear on getting to net zero by 2045. Um, and part of it uh, is by using carbon removal solutions. They even quantify this by nature-based solutions and VEX and whatnot. So that's very clear in terms of like the advancement in that space in, in, in Sweden. Norway and the Netherlands are very much focused as well in the CCUS projects, uh, which again, it, it's part of uh, the value chains that carbon removal also uh, shares, especially in the utilization and sequestration side of things. So, so that's exciting. Um, and then focused more on uh, in the UK. Uh, I believe the UK is a bit more advanced than Europe in this space. Uh, they have already started uh, back in some years time, like uh, in 2017, the UK launched a, a GGR uh, research program um, about they, they put about uh, nine million pounds uh, for that, and most recently you've been seeing way more developments. There's um, we we developed we uh, the UK has uh, developed a net zero industrial decarbonization strategy was the, the the world's first major economy to present that. Uh, of course, uh, on that there's uh, investment for carbon removal. Uh, so there's a one billion. CCUS infrastructure funds. Um, and again, I think you can always comprise carbon removal, uh, include carbon removal uh, in that fund as well. Um, and more specifically for carbon removal, uh, over the last year, there has been some funding from the government, 100 million put into the space. So it's really focused on GGR demonstrators uh, that uh, analyze the effectiveness uh, of these solutions and advise the government on that. Uh, and really uh, the creation of a DAC and market development um, in this space. So, so that's very exciting. Also something we've been seeing is corporate uh, voluntary negative offsetting markets that has started in UK. Uh, you already know that in US that has already happened, uh, but in UK that has started uh, as of last year, BrewDog uh, has been doubling down on that. Um, and there's many other organizations and projects um, that are uh, accelerating in this space. So uh, I'll stop here. I can speak more about it uh, more in, in more detail, but uh, just to say that in general, the momentum is growing in Europe. Europe is very focused on climate. So I see um, things growing in the carbon wall space, uh, as well as specifically in the UK, who wants to be a leader uh, in their carbonization. Thanks, Patricia. And I particularly liked that you highlighted the uh, in the European climate law, this distinction where they're actually having a separate target for removals, which I actually think serves a very important purpose because it helps diffuse one of the most potent arguments against CDR, which is the moral hazard and the idea that uh, removals is a, is a fig leaf to, to delay mitigation, but the, they've actually deliberately have those targets separately. So we can say, yes, we want to accomplish this much reductions, but also removals. Um, just to reshift the conversation, I think, you know, now we've got a lay of the land, but I, I wouldn't want our listeners to think that, you know, having heard this um, list of, you know, many exciting and great policy opportunities, 
that that's even close to enough and that what we have in place is even remotely appropriate for the challenge we face. So I'd love to switch now and just hear briefly from each of you, um, what do you think like effective CDR policy looks like? What do we need in terms of R&D budgets, deployment incentives to actually get to gigaton scale, which we know from the representative emissions pathways in the IPCC will be required in, in a very short amount of time. So we should celebrate the successes and we should acknowledge that the US is probably ahead of Europe in a lot of the specific uh, arenas of policy. But yeah, what do you think needs to happen and what's the big ambition that each of you see uh, for uh, carbon removal policy to actually get it on track to deliver what we know it needs to? Maybe we'll just take it in reverse order, Patricia, Chris, and then Eric. It's good if you're not tired of listening to me. <laughs> so, so there are some things that uh, I, I mentioned, like the good things about uh, the development of carbon removal in, the, in this region. Uh, but there are some things that I also notice, um, especially in the UK, because it has been advancing in different fronts uh, around carbon removal, putting incentives and everything into place. Uh, but it looks like everything is a bit, uh, let's say, scattered. Uh, so uh, there's a fragmented, the, the sector is fragmented. So um, yeah, there, you have different social uh, government departments uh, having their own strategies, but there's no like union. There, there needs to be a better articulation of a strategy uh, around carbon removal. And there's something that I, I believe it's missing a lot is also including the basically the social legitimacy on that. So um, for, yeah, to have a strong foundation for legitimate GGR, that implies securing that individual and community level um, legitimacy. So I think there's missing like that connection with the, the communities and everything else. So Chris was telling a bit more about uh, that space, like coming from the municipalities and everything else and, and hearing the, the citizens as well and, and making them participate. Um, so that local awareness um, and accommodate, accommodating community needs and values is very important to, to establish a strong uh, GDR policy um, in, into the space. Um, yeah, so, so that's the main thing. Uh, I think I wanted to say something about it, but go ahead, Chris, if I remember, uh, I'll go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that, again, a bias from my sort of solar days and just looking at the history of solar is that there's almost, we have to do two things at once where we have to be headed towards gigaton scale, but not get too biased in favor of just gigantic immediate and acknowledge the fact that in the next five to 10 years, we really have to put a focus on getting CD, getting DAC, let's just take DAC as, as an example, out into the world by any means necessary and in any way we possibly can. In a lot of ways, those early adopters contrast very sharply with what we might envision as the DAC endgame, which may in fact involve large deployments um, and storage, where we have to be constructing policies that just help nudge some of these niches developed that are most ready, you know what I mean? So that's why I look a lot at, you know, when you look at states and cities, you feel almost like you're, you know, you're sort of, almost like a DJ or something looking for records. You're looking for little ins or little details in a local environment where you could hook back onto. So I look in New York, we just legalized cannabis. Cannabis has a horrendous carbon footprint and they're highly, highly taxed. And so you could potentially come up with a policy that is a tax break uh, for cannabis for its use in, in, in grow, growing operations. That might not have a negative result. It might not affect our overall uh, carbon in the atmosphere, but it helps get these units out into the world. And that's what we need to do to reduce the costs. And there's many of those that we could, you know, point to that are not on the normal list. I think of what people think about is the carbon, you know, this DAC end game, but of those ones that we have to do now, because that's going to bend the curve. And just a, a lesson from solar, it wasn't until 2016 that most solar modules that were produced were for large use utility scale projects. And by that point, the cost curve had already bent down. I saw it happen with my own eyes. I spent my 15 years watching that happen. That happened on the backs of distributed residential, uh, commercial and industrial projects. That's what brought the cost down. So I think we have to do that or have to think about that with DAC as well, but we have to do it a lot faster um, than solar. So I think there are a few, you know, we talked about, as you pointed out, Eli, there are a lot of uh, kind of policy wins that have happened at the U.S. federal level in the past couple of years. But I think there are several pieces where it's sort of like this is what's next. And I'll say we're actually going to come out with a policy roadmap that has 
uh, 80 plus pages of near term policy recommendations for Congress. So I'm going to attempt to sort of summarize those at a very high level. So one piece of this is more R&D money. Tens of millions of dollars for carbon removal is fantastic. What we need is hundreds of millions of dollars and a billion dollars. You know, we are a billion dollars a year. And we need that really across the federal government and across pathways. So not just talking about DOE and direct air capture or DOE and soil carbon, but talking about really, you know, there are efforts. Uh, there's a bill called the CREATE Act that looks at really high level federal agency coordination. And we need that really thoughtful uh, that really thoughtful engagement and coordination at, at the U.S. federal level, and we need a lot of funding for it. Um, we also need infrastructure. I totally agree with Chris, and we work uh, really around things like the potential for small-scale or building-scale direct air capture, but we're also talking about really scaling this up over the next couple of decades, and we will need lots of infrastructure, whether that is for smaller-scale applications or for really big megaton plants. And thinking now about how to create, how the federal government can create that enabling infrastructure for us to build off of and for, for um, you know, DAC and other carbon removal solutions to build off of, I think is really important. The U.S., I think, sometimes has an approach, uh, you know, I think about point source carbon capture, where the federal policy approach with things like the Future Gen Project, where put a bunch of money into a really big demonstration plant. You're going to bring down the costs in part by learning, you know, uh, through learning by doing. Totally makes sense. And then by bringing down that cost, you're going to see a bunch of plants deployed. And I think the piece, one of the pieces that misses is that enabling infrastructure, making sure that you can, you know, the role of the federal government building that out. I think related to that is actually the regulatory space and not in the sense of mandating carbon removal in the near term, but looking at some of the barriers to deployment right now in the regulatory space. So I think particularly of the class six program at EPA. So you capture store underground safely in the saline reservoir. It's going to take you probably about five to six years to get a permit to do that. And that's a large part because the program is really underfunded. There need to be some updates. We're going to come out with some recommendations around this. But you need to address some of those barriers that aren't as, you know, everybody knows that we need to break down the cost of direct air capture. Far fewer folks are thinking about how do you fix, you know, a $3 million a year program at the, the EPA right now. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is I actually think, too, when we're thinking about scale, you know, there are, you know, parallels we can draw with things like solar. I think all of that can be really helpful. But when it comes down to it, you've got a very different model for carbon removal, right? You're not, you know, carbon, we're really ambitious about carbon tech, but ultimately what you're talking about is, you know, if you think about the Kim Stanley Robinson article or how Klaus Lackner's talk about it as a waste management kind of problem. And so you're talking about paying for carbon removal and you're not talking about bringing down the cost in a way that is like you know you're going to produce electricity at a super low cost um and so i think we need to think about things like direct federal purchasing of carbon removal and i think that there are some really interesting policy models there that can not only help us deploy it but also do it in ways that are really really durable and really thoughtful because you know when we've worked with stripe and shopify and others i think talking to them about being a purchaser for carbon removal, not only one do you see that result in very real deployment in the near term, but I think it also helps clarify that those those barriers like classic. So instead of just relying on, hey, this is how we do energy innovation policy in the U.S. We build a big plant, we you know produce it, we 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 create a production tax credit. All of that's great, but if you're a purchaser, for example, of carbon removal, you're not worried about how you used to do federal policy for clean energy innovation. You're talking about project developer and being like, what is your exact barrier? And that's where I think you get more specific and intentional focus on things that are actually affecting you know, those folks on the ground. I think you get that across the board. So I was talking about direct air capture, but you also understand like MRV on the soil side is very, very tough and we just need some basic science needs. So it's not just about that incentive model. So I think we're really excited about some potential opportunities like that. That's fantastic, Erin. I think you really kind of, for me, surveyed and bucketed the different areas that we need. And like certainly tons of money for early stage de de development. Some technologies really need that. Then there's this piece that I think Chris touched on a little bit, which is deployment incentives. How do you actually get things to, to move at pace? And that's things like the feed-in tariffs in Germany, the contract for difference in the UK, the production and investment tax credits in the US. Different countries have different models, and we should be sympathetic to the fact that the US loves to use the tax code, other countries not so much. Um, and then I think the third piece that you touched on is this idea of cutting red tape. And it's like, there are these sort of non-sexy things like 
fixing the London protocol so that CO2 can more easily move among cross borders. Um, people don't talk about that. So I, I think props to you for identifying that, you know, we can actually find just places to make things easier. And then fourth and finally, this piece around standards and regulations, MRV, uh, you know, some CDR solutions really need help on that front. Others really need help on the down costing. So I think that was really helpful. So thank you all three of you for, for going there. In a moment, we're going to switch over to the, you know, the mayhem of, of people joining us on stage. It'll be kind of cool. I haven't done this in an in-person conference where somebody just actually joins us. So please get ready to ask to join and I'll bring you on and you can ask your question and we'll do our best to answer it. Um, before we do that, I just wanted to bring in one last topic that came up when we were preparing for this panel that I thought was really interesting. And the insight comes from the contrast between what's happening in, in Europe or sort of the attitudes towards carbon removal in Europe versus the attitude in the US. I think Carbon 180 and, and others, including Open Air Collective, can take a lot of credit for getting the US ecosystem to a point where carbon removal as a concept isn't ex extremely controversial. It's seen as a complement to emission reductions, but nonetheless a, a necessary one. In contrast, in Europe, what we're seeing is there's a lot of resistance even to the, the idea of removing carbon full stop. And then there's a lot of sort of uh, my solution versus your solution battles between, to put it simply, the tech uh, side and the nature-based side. So one thing we started to, to tease out when we were talking before this, this panel is what is there anything fundamentally different about the, the, the US culture or, or something that makes carbon removal more amenable? Or is that a, a false way to look at it? What, what is it that allowed the US ecosystem to, to actually engage with this topic and for philanthropists, ENGOs, and others to actually think about carbon removal rather than uh, shove it aside as something not, not to engage with? Maybe, um, maybe Chris or Aaron, if you want to come in that, because I know you, you had some thoughts when we talked about this last time. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, I don't know if we're as far along as we need to be, to be honest. I think um, that came up in our, our discussion. I think we have a long way to go. I think there's an identity problem that in some ways is hardening, I think, around direct air capture. If we look at that, that some people perceive it to be sort of an extension, legitimate or illegitimate, of the extraction industry that bunker-owning billionaires tend to, you know, really have a thing for, you know, and that's not exactly going to mobilize the grassroots, I think. So I think that's our, our, our bigger issue, I think, is around... We, we have to show a more creative vision, both in terms of production, utilization, ownership of what direct air capture can become. It can't be just a bunch of big boxes with tubes on them sitting in the middle of some placeless, you know, rendering. It can, that's not going to work. Uh, that will be vulnerable. So, but I do think that there, I'd love to hear Aaron's thoughts on this and, and, um, and, and Patricia's, but there might be something where we have a history in the United States sometimes of starting late on things but once we start we kind of really get going and i think that us mobilizing coincides with the emergence of dac the 2018 1.5 report that we know that we have to do carbon dioxide removal that i think we're starting to get a wider circle of people across the spectrum that are like okay we're involved in it what can we do now and there's just been this giant burst of energy around cdr because people are like oh you can do that 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 is a thing we're not doomed so I think it's just starting to really trigger a lot of the kind of the best strengths, I think, in the United States in terms of entrepreneurship, creativity, you know, not being too latched to the past. And you know, it's happening maybe just in time. Yeah, I think, um, no, that I think that's right. I mean, I think there are a couple of things. Like, one is I have to give, again, a, a huge amount of credit to Noah and Gianna. I actually met Noah um, when he came in the Senate in 2015, I think I mentioned. And I worked on point source carbon capture a ton in the Senate, and that was something everybody worked on. I didn't know anything about direct air capture at that time. And so our first meeting was like, is this real? Like, what is this guy saying? Like, you know, is he a legit guy? Um, and we ended up writing an early amendment together, but this is something where they were doing that groundwork and you had some early philanthropy support for people doing something that nobody else was doing and who could sort of be thoughtful about, no, this is coming down the pike. So you had these people who had this vision that, yeah, nobody's talking about it right now, but like we need to we've talked to the academics and they approached it, I think, in a way that is very different than U.S. federal policy creation normally happens. And so I think that making sure that you have philanthropy funding those sort of visionary people at an early stage when it seems a little like you're like, this is not real. I'm like, is this legit? Um, but I think the other thing is that, you know, all of those things kind of happened at once where you had the NAS report, you had the 1.5 degree report. I think it also helps 
us loves innovation. Like we love to talk about R&D. We have our 17 national labs. Like we have, you know, we love investing in universities and, you know, just the way that the sort of ecosystem of funding and policy is set up where policymakers, like they want to, you know, you've got a state with a, a national lab, you've got a state with a research university, we're doing everything to put money into those places. And so you had those academics who were interested in it. The NAS says, put a bunch of money into the Department of Energy. That's really bipartisan. That's something that folks really support. And you already had some of the groundwork with things like mission innovation under the Obama administration. And so I think that you saw really quick early success there. I think you also saw because there has been, I think part of the reason you see more policy support in the US right now for direct air capture versus land-based uh, approaches is because, and I think this is tricky into what Chris pointed out, you know, it was able to piggyback a little bit off of point source carbon capture. And the US by and large is ahead of Europe on point source carbon capture. Now, not exclusively, obviously, Norway does a huge amount of stuff. I actually think there's, you know, to that point about things like future gen versus infrastructure, I think like there's a huge amount to learn from the approach that Northern Europe has taken. But, you know, it was something that tension, I think, typically in the US. And so if you're able to piggyback off of that, then you can get some early successes, right? We didn't say create a new DAC tax credit. We said just just write in direct air capture when you're doing your 45Q work. Like that that update in, 20, in 2018 happened. That was a seven year process that was primarily pursued by point source carbon capture advocates, not by direct. Like that was Carbon 180 was the direct air capture advocate in that process. Now that's changed mm -hmm. and there are lots of those folks who are now direct air capture advocates, but they're able to piggyback off of that. And so I think that also helped cement support for direct air capture. Um, and I think the last thing I'll mention is that, you know, I, I totally agree with Chris's point that, you know, U.S. federal policy is to some degree inaccessible by design or they're very good at gatekeeping. But I also think new members and like, you know, climate kind of exploded at the same time. You had op-eds in 2015 through 2016, 17, where you'd see Republicans and Democrats get together and say, we all agree climate change is something we have to do something about. We might agree, we not agree on what it can be. And carbon removal provided this new opportunity for them to support something that didn't have a lot of baggage. It wasn't seen as partisan. It was a blank slate. And you can kind of project your sort of own values on it. You know, you can come from an ag state and you have farmers who are interested in soil carbon removal because it's going to help their farm and their bottom line. They're going to have product developers who are interested in direct air capture. You can say, look, the cement, you know, you can talk about cement and concrete production. You can talk about, uh, you know, CO2 to fuel. So I think that that was another piece of it that was allowing, that, that really allowed CDR to take off in the U.S. really quickly as all of those pieces and the timing really aligned very well. Thanks. And sorry, Chris, I know you, you probably have a piece to jump in on, but I actually, just because we're over overdue, I want to switch yeah. and maybe you can bring it in as we uh, bring in our audience here. We've got Ben, Fabian, uh, Ross, a few others are queuing up. So feel free to ask questions in the chat. Feel free to ask to speak and we'll bring you on stage and, and let's get the discussion a little bit more interactive. Uh, ben, can you see and hear us? There you are. I can see you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Wonderful. Thank, thanks for inviting me in and thanks for the, this great conversation. So yeah, I'm, I'm based in Paris. I'm launching a climate tech venture builder and as a side project, uh, actually I'm, I'm working with Eli and, and others to help to launch this uh, uh, CDR advocacy in Europe. And yeah, I just wanted to react to what you said, Erin, regarding the fact that in the US you could piggyback on, on CCS. I think probably uh, one of the reasons why there's some resistance in Europe regarding uh, CDR is because the boundary between both is, is seen as quite porous and I think CCS has been kind of rejected by some groups typically environmental NGOs in the past who let's 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 face it they, they have done an amazing work to raise awareness about the climate crisis and the need to, to decarbonize in, in Europe but they have framed the debate or they have contributed to frame the debate in a way that it's their worldview, and that includes some solution, but does not include other solutions. Typically, CCS has been kind of the taboo, uh, fake solution for, for mm -hmm. some of those. And I think, um, especially because in some languages, the differences between capture and removal uh, is not easy. Like in French, you say capture the carbon for both, basically. And that kind of confuses, I think, the minds uh, yeah, even more. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, most of the voices which are uh, that we can hear in Europe about the subject are typically corporates uh, and a lot of fossil fuel companies. So I guess, I guess it has a little more confusion. So 
uh, we're in dire need of our organization like Carbon 118 mm -hmm. to be this independent yeah. voice that people can, can rely on for kind of as a trusted source. No, I mean, I think that's actually the language problem, even in the U.S., is something we come up against, that people will say carbon capture removal. So, so people will say carbon capture and they mean direct air capture or they mean CCS and CDR. Like, there is a huge language issue, even in the U.S., and um, don't even start on the acronyms we love to use. But, you know, I think this is actually a growing problem in the U.S. as well, and Chris kind of touched on this, is if you only have DAC deployment with oil companies, there are going to be concerns, and they're going to be very legitimate concerns. And to your point, yeah, in Europe, who's talking about CCS, primarily large oil companies, right? Um, and I think in the U.S., advantage of having the Department of Energy really invest in these. I think it's probably somewhat similar-ish when you're thinking about Norway and Gas Nova, and you have a little bit of this, you know, CCS deployment that's happening in the industrial sector and, and, and those sorts of things that are a little bit disjointed. But, you know, I think it is absolutely essential. You know, we launched an environmental justice initiative. Our deputy director of policy, Ogai Kosar, leads that work for us. And there are very legitimate questions and concerns from everything from saline storage to the role of enhanced oil recovery or who's profiting off of direct air capture, even if you aren't doing EOR. And I think it is essential for the success of this for us to, to talk about that, to figure out strong policy work for that. I think one of the things about procurement that is exciting is that if you are the U.S. federal government as a purchaser of CDR, then you can, from day one, make sure that you have really strong community engagement. You can put in environmental justice priorities. You can put in strong labor practices. Like, And this is something we've seen that the current Department of Energy is actually prioritizing. Dr. Suchi Talati is the chief of staff of the Office of Fossil Energy, where most CCS uh, and CDR work happens at the U.S. federal level and was our deputy director of policy before that um, until January. And this is something that at the University at, um, at the Union of Concerned Scientists and other places that she's really worked on and things like community engagement. How do you do this in an environmentally just way? So I think it's a huge issue in the US. I think it is starting to emerge and become much clearer that it's a huge issue, but I'm hopeful that this administration and some of the policies that are coming out now will be successful in starting to address it. Thanks. And and I, I really liked um yeah, I think there's some interesting points there around the the importance of like an independent voice as well in some in some areas, including in the U.S. I think this sort of association with the fossil fuel industry is is potentially dangerous. Um, uh, I want to move quickly because we're just getting so many great questions. Um, I'm going to bring in Sue uh, for a moment. Sue, are you are you with us? Just going to say Sue is one of the uh, most active open air members, the total champion based out of New Jersey. Ooh, New Jersey, yeah. Wow. Uh, so one of the things that I've encountered, and I'm just kind of putting the pieces together here, I'm working on state level low carbon concrete legislation. And I'm seeing that we're kind of like in this middle area, we've got the sort of the super green folks who don't want to see uh, anything that is promoting industry or as you mentioned, fossil fuels. Um, and they see industry as the bad guy and they want to address pollution and not have, I don't know, not have any of the big players win. And then there's the, I am having no luck getting Republicans on board in New Jersey um, because they don't want the additional expense of government procurement program for the low carbon concrete. So I feel like we're kind of in the middle, like between the, you know, the conservatives and the, and the tree huggers and that we have to kind of walk this fine line to make it make all the constituents happy and i'm wondering if you've observed any sort of tricks of the trade or or certain talking points that appeal to these different constituencies i'm happy to mention um I think there are a couple of things that we found helpful at the federal level, and this may be slightly different at the state level, so I'm sure Chris has thoughts, but one is that um, I think, for example, people think about renewables as something that Democrats like and Republicans don't. And while if you had a breakdown that might like roughly pencil out at the federal level, what I think it ignores is state and local level interests. So if you're a senator from Iowa, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat, you definitely like wind power. 
Um, and so I think that what we found is an opportunity to be really specific in how we appeal to people and to make it really tangible for their, like the benefits for their state and district. So if we're able to go in and talk to, um, you know, a member that has university in their area that's interested in that's, that, this, that's great, but they also may be interested in sort of like innovation policy. And so we can say, you know, we can sort of frame it as an innovation policy and not focus so much on the regulatory piece. I think that um, the other thing that we found um, helpful on that front is um, is really, and this isn't this is only mildly helpful, I'm sure, is some of its time and trust building. Um, I think that, you know, we we're talking about, oh, there's all this explosion of federal policy. But again, we spent like this is really new. We spent a long we spent years not just telling people what carbon goal is, but like why they should care about it and like addressing those problems. And I think really, you know, not everybody is a good faith actor in this space. And some of their concerns are really just you know, reasons that they're trying to get you to not engage. But if they do have really concerns, I think grappling with those and being able to bring in other trusted actors and sort of like, who do they get their information from? Can you go and have that conversation with them? Can you build trust with people that they trust? And so a lot of it for us has also been like really strategic trust and relationship building, even if you can't get directly to your target. But I'm like I said, I'm sure Chris uh, yeah, has a much more nuanced state level opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think what you just kind of summed up, there's many different, it's, these are three dimensional objects in terms of what they mean, you know, and every time you try to talk about them in a local context, it's not so simple as just Republican and Democrat. There's always a thing there, a rough edge that you could potentially pursue that links someone to that, you know? So I think the issue that Sue also raised though, is, is you can take the sort of the Republican side or the conservative side or the, the right side of the aisle. But I do think we have issues within the environmental movement. You know, I think that there are, things that we're having a hard time getting over where there's some just sort of deep old pre Thoreau biases that are part of the conservation movement, I think, that create certain blinders or phobias or allergies to innovation sometimes. You know, um, I even saw that with solar. I mean, solar was a boogeyman uh, two decades ago for some people, um, you know, that it was a technical solution to something that really should be resolved by just using less. So, so that's just something we have to sort of deal with. I think it sort of triggers um, the, a certain environmental sensibility um, that um, is sometimes at least as hard to sort of talk through as I would say is Republicans that we engage with. Um, I don't know if, if others on the call would agree, um, but th that's been my experience. We always, we also, I should say, we, we try to root it in, start with the numbers, start with the, we always say, believe in the science. That's been the mantra for the climate movement forever. Well, you can't be selective with that. If we've reached a point where we know to stay with 1.5, we have to take a lot of carbon out of the air. So I try to sort of start from that point of view, I guess, when I do talk to people that are at least on board for climate action. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Sue. Um, I, I want to mo keep moving because we just have so many great questions coming in. Um, one question that I saw in the chat um, that came from Aditya, I thought was particularly important to, to bring up, which is that, you know, as they put it, much of the CDR discussion is happening in the global north. And so when we think about, uh, he writes, when we think about co-benefits, social environmental equity, and potential for scaling innovations, what is your perspective on the role of the Global South? Uh, I don't know, Patricia, or anybody want to jump in and, and tackle that? And I think we should also talk a little bit about the, as we did earlier, the sort of uh, intersection of environmental justice uh, with carbon removal. Uh, well, happy to start. Um... And that touches a point that I mentioned before, even I feel that there's in the UK, as we do research, the Carbon Removal Center does research and, and some reports on that. Uh, Global South has not had a voice in the space. Um, and especially, I think, in general, you look at basically the, the communities and how you should uh, advance and, and giving a voice and making them participative in the conversation. So uh, that part of starting with a bottom-up approach, I think it's also very important for uh, that, that, that region of the world, um, including them, be participative, be pluralistic, uh, and really accommodate uh, them in the discussions to start with. Uh, because if they see we're kind of taking over, like the more developed nations are taking over and think this is great for you, but we don't include them in the conversations, uh, probably going to have many issues that we see in Europe in terms of the discussions, the communications and awareness, like what we're doing, what is it safe? Uh, is it good for the local communities? Are we creating jobs? And 
and uh, basically are we developing the industry i think that's very important so again focus on that part of the the social justice uh, and equity considerations as well um but yeah it would be great to hear from the others as well I mean, I think that the, the, the North-South global justice issues are really just the most central part of this discussion here, and that it's interesting to see the discourse that is that is coming out of the South. You know, I, I was really, I thought it was incredibly interesting to get a lot of residents to play, but the, minister, uh, the Indian Minister of um, uh, Energy and Power, I believe, you know, a few, uh, maybe a month ago on a forum with you know, world leaders, you know, basically put it out there. He's like, you, it's not enough for you to go neutral right now. You got to go negative. You, you've, as, as, as Holly Jean Buck wrote a really great way, it's the sort of the colonization of the atmosphere. You know, all that atmosphere that you got rich off of that you've just basically taken away from our futures, you got to take that away. And to me, I think that's actually, when we talk about justice, that to me is the, the most powerful argument that, that can be made. Absolutely, could not agree more. I think uh, Kiowa's recent piece in the Atlantic was another uh, a similar approach, which is just, you know, don't overthink this. Like, you know, you can have your preferences about specific solutions. And, and, and I think often the sort of nature tech divide is a bit of a false dichotomy. But nevertheless, you know, you can have all of those conversations. But at the end of the day, it's not that complicated. We, we got rich putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere and, and somebody's got to take it out. The other piece Eli, that I don't think. If I can add one thing that might be controversial, though, I think on the flip side of that, we have to acknowledge that the fundamental job of CDR is to re remove carbon dioxide. And so I think when it comes to deployment, we have to have a do no harm policy where burdens and trade-offs are equitably distributed and not put on the backs of poor people. But at the same time, there's an emerging discourse that direct air capture and CDR also have to do all of these other things uh, that are, are good for society. And I think when we're talking about a technology that is so far behind schedule for deployment, we, we have to have a sort of a balanced view of what's the primary objective vis-a-vis -vis justice of carbon dioxide removal. I think it's removing carbon dioxide. Absolutely. I don't think that's that controversial at all, I would say. Um, the, the other piece I just wanted to bring in really quickly on, on the sort of uh, responsibility piece is something we don't talk a lot about is earth system feedback. And the fact that a lot of the carbon stocks that we think of as sinks are, are quite likely to flip into sources, even in response to just 1.5 degrees of warming, which unfortunately we're on track to, to experience. And so there's a lot of emissions that are sort of, that are coming down the pike that are not very attributable. You won't be able to easily point your finger to these you know, multiple, in some estimates on the order of like 10 gigatons a year that could be coming from some of these sources. You know, who's gonna be responsible for that? So s somebody will have to remove that as well. So I think it, all of this is in service of making our ambitions bigger that it's not just about achieving net zero for your country. Obviously, that's the battle we have to fight in a lot of these domiciles now, but it's actually much bigger. It's going to be, you know, how do we scrub out all of your historical emissions and also keep pace with these new sources of emissions that aren't directly attributable to any one country, but are the clear result of anthropogenic warming um, that's already come in. Um, sorry, Aaron, I think you wanted to come in on this, but I also want to bring in Fabian in a minute. Cool. I'll bring Fabian on to uh, throw in a new question. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much for the really interesting discussion. Um, it's obviously very topical. Um, as some of you might know, I'm, as I've spoken to some of you before, I'm producing a documentary about carbon removal, specifically with a, a focus on youth. Um, and I wanted to know what the average person, the average Jane or Joe, can do to help the CDR industry grow, um, whether make it socially accepted or just grow, you know, purchasing carbon removal offsets. Just like, what can the average person do to, to help this industry? Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, Sylvia, please. Patricia, please. Well, happy to things that the, the, the youth can do. And first of that, first of all, is to really educate themselves because the carbon removal is a large topic. There's a lot of ways to go about it. So really educating. There's a lot of organizations out there like C180. They have a lot of papers, like very easily explaining what it is. The Carbon Removal Center is also doing that and many others. So first of all, educate and know what you're talking about more specifically, because again, like you can talk about carbon capture instead of carbon removal. And uh, so be very uh, knowledgeable of what you're talking, like the basics. Uh, and then, yeah, just be out there, be be like connect to these organizations, for instance, nonprofits such as the Carbon Removal Center, C180, CR Advocacy Europe and others, um, and see what you can do in your local um, region, um, and basically start talking, advocating, uh, 
post it on social media, your concerns, what's out there, the innovations uh, and everything else, not just saying, okay, like don't put just the state of emergency. Of course, there's a state of emergency, but also puts the, the, the hopeful uh, state of things. Like there are technologies out there that are already uh, doing the work, uh, removing carbon, both nature-based solutions and technolo technological solutions. You need that portfolio approach. Um, and many solutions can be regionally focused in terms of what can be done in that region. So, um, yeah, just explore, uh, reach out to us uh, and see how we can add value in your region and eventually uh, go to conferences uh, where you, you basically can connect with others, uh, politicians and, and, and people in your region as well uh, to really make a difference and have your voice heard. Aaron, please go ahead. If you, I have a quick thought to give, but I, I don't want to jump ahead. Great. I mean, I, I would say Fabian, awesome to see you, by the way. Fabian is uh, a member of Open Air as well. Um, I think a real key thing is that everyday people can not only support good CDR policy, they can research it, conceive it, write it, and get it introduced. I think that that is a huge area of impact that we're really focused on at Open Air is that you, I could take five Open Air members at random and with two months in commitment, they could come up with a great piece of legislation to apply in their area that's related to CDR. If you squint, legislation looks almost like source code, even as the numbers on the side. It's the kind of thing that can be created collectively by many different people and implemented, particularly at the state and local level. So if you're interested in that, that's kind of our, our bread and butter on open air on the advocacy side is that you can really, really get, uh, get policy going. You don't need to wait for organizations to push that. Yeah, I mean, we're fundamentally people who think it's about, I think, large scale policy. Um, but I think there are many ways to get involved. So I think just like Chris said, local and state policy can be more accessible than federal policy and incredibly important and impactful. Um, and not just like through the direct impacts, but also like Chris has pointed out with the New York state law LECLA, or the New York state work on LECLA, that we're seeing that translated to federal action as well. I think in addition to that, the sort of advocacy piece, like, you know, the Sunrise Movement has been wildly impactful. Like these youth led climate movements have fundamentally changed how the president of the United States approaches climate. Climate was, when we think back the previous election, um, it, climate was like issue number seven in the US. And like the problem was like, yes, most voters agree that climate change is an issue, but it's nobody's priority or very few people's priority. And you've maybe heard a little bit on the, the main stage about it. That has changed in and, and large part because of youth climate movement. So there is a huge opportunity and potential impact there. Um, but I'll say, you know, yes, well, first of all, we're hiring uh, if folks are interested. Um, We've got a lot of uh, brilliant folks at Carbon 180 doing a lot of thinking about this um, in the policy space and others. I'll say I get calls all the time about folks looking for people who want to work on carbon wool policy and they have open jobs. Um, but, you know, if you're interested in the research side of this, like the you know, tons of universities are looking at this. We are part of something called the New Carbon Economy Consortium, which is a group of national labs and research universities. There are amazing, innovative things happening in this space. If I think about Shashank and Heirloom that was launched um, and working you know, with all of our entrepreneurs and residents. And you know, this is a space where if you want to be an innovator, if you want to create technology, if you want to work on a practice to do better MRV on soils, like it, there are so many opportunities here. So if policy isn't your thing, there are other ways to engage on carbon removal. Um, and then I think, yeah, like to Patricia's point, like there are lots of opportunities to sort of educate yourself, figure out what you're interested in. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is, uh, I think most of us probably already know this, but, uh, if you work on carbon removal, you love talking about carbon removal to anybody. So, uh, you know, our emails are just like first name at carbon 180. Like we get emails from students who want to talk about this and we have, we have an internship program over the summer. Um, we have fantastic interns. Um, you know, there are all of these opportunities. And I think anybody on this panel, you know, so many people in carbon removal, like reach out. We're happy to be resources and talk about why we love this and, and kind of how to work on it more. Just to add to that, um, and I love this last uh, question and, and discussion and how to, to help accelerate the, 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 the youth, move, youth movement in the space. You also have air miners as, as a community, right? So you got the Slack channels that like there's so many about uh, either jobs in the space as well as interesting projects that you can work together with the community, collaborating, 
Um, so, so yeah, if you just joined the, the community, as you might be there already because you're here uh, in this conference, there's a lot of things going on, like people are super interested and engaged. So feel free to start with a project uh, in one of these uh, organizations, uh, well, communities, uh, and start searching for what you like. That's fantastic. I think we need to close there, but I think it's just a testament to uh, the points just made around the fact that you can get involved. It's a testament to the energy around this that we've had so many questions we haven't been able to answer. So I'm, I'm for one, excited. We should almost just uh, you know, hop right over to the policy channel in Air Miners right now and keep talking about this. Um, but I just wanted to extend a thanks to Air Miners for organizing and making this happen and really highlighting policy as an issue. Again, I'll just close with the fact that you know, CDR is, is one of these unique elements of climate that it, it needs policy. Policy is what create will create an enduring market that can actually deliver net zero and make, make removals essentially the law of the land. After all, it is essentially a waste disposal problem, I think, as Chris mentioned earlier. And thank you so much to the panelists, Patricia, Aaron, and Chris. Fantastic job. Really, really wonderful to hear you uh, speak today. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending.